Like the first one out of the jar, welcome to The Big Pickle, our weekly whip around the world of women's golf. I'm Grant Boone, joined by my co-host from Golf Week, Beth Ann Nichols, the only full-time independent beat writer covering the women's game. BA, happy Chevron week, happy Nelly Streak week, happy debut of The Big Pickle. I think we should start right there with that line in your bio you are the only woman the only person covering women's golf on a regular basis and i think that's one of the reasons that you and i a few years ago began scheming uh to to maybe put a podcast together i think we picked a pretty good week to get this thing going oh it's it's the perfect week so much potential buzz around the women's game i'll say because i I really don't think now has gotten enough credit for what she's done so far and 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 as you say you know it's we've both been doing this for decades covering the women's game and uh and it is it is an increasingly smaller footprint in terms of the number of journalists who are out any given week uh and even at the majors it's it's pretty small so so the hope is that you know, we can help, you know, generate some of that buzz uh, and, and provide some 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 much needed information for folks since since we are on the ground uh, more than most and, and, and paying attention. So I'm, I'm excited to, to to get into some 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 of the tour's biggest pickles <laughs> with you. <laughs> well, if we have time at the end of the show, maybe we can explain where we came up with the title of the pod, which is completely unhelpful in describing the fact that we're covering women's golf. But the, the plan uh, each week is to give you a tournament recap on a Sunday or a Monday morning, a little pickle spear, a little sweet gherkin maybe, uh, uh, or, you know, and that'll be the weekly, that'll be the weekly uh, slice or spear. Uh, and then and then once a month, we'll do a longer form uh, visit with a legend like the one we have for you today, our friend and Hall of Fame member, Judy Rankin. Uh, and then if big stuff happens uh, otherwise, we might get the band together quickly for a quick slice. So let's begin with Nelly and the fact that we're watching something that just hasn't been done, B.A., in a long time. Things that um, that she's done over the last few weeks. I can rattle off a few of them. If you're listening to this podcast, there's a pretty good chance you already know. But she's won four straight starts, four straight times that she's teed it up on the LPGA Tour, she's won. Uh, There was a seven-week break between the first one, which was in her hometown of Bradenton, when she beat Lydia Ko in a playoff at the drive-on, to the time she played in Southern California, the Fur Hills Championship uh, that uh, honored Sayri Pak. Uh, And then she won the next two weeks, and then they took last week off when the men were playing at the Masters. Uh, And so let me just ask you, as you think about all of these things she's done, she won in Bradenton, Florida, she won in Southern California, then she won in the desert of the Phoenix area, then she won in Vegas at a course that I think a lot of players think is very much a major championship caliber course, one of the hardest I'll ever play, Shadow Creek. As you think back over this run that she's on, uh, which, uh, you know, has put her on the doorstep of tying an all-time LPGA record for most number of starts one in a row five and the most number of events on the calendar four of all of those things she's done which uh, is most impressive to you but we'll start there because you know that coming back after a seven week break and and winning again is incredible but i i do think that winning three straight weeks in such incredibly different and difficult conditions on different types of grass uh, you know, even even the desert was terrible weather yeah. <laughs> when, when they went down to when they went down to Phoenix. You know, I, I think, you know, and you throw in match play into that, too. And you think you think by the time she gets to Vegas, she's just going to be gassed, you know, playing in those types of conditions with that crazy win with, with a cut for stroke play to even make it to match play. She had to play 54 holes of stroke play and finish in the top eight. And, and the cut there was nine over. I mean, it, it was it was absolutely brutal. And and she still, you know, had the stamina uh, mentally and physically to, to come out on top. And so, you know, it's interesting when she talked to the press yesterday here at the Woodlands, she said, 
she's never been more tired than she was last week. Like difficult to get out of bed, tired, just wanted to sleep all day. Uh, but the, the beauty of it is that, you know, her parents, uh, you know, who are Peter and Regina, who are obviously, you know, former world-class tennis players, you know, they are very encouraging of, of that recovery and that rest and insisted that she get as much rest as possible last week leading into this, this event. So I, I do think she is as refreshed as she could possibly be coming into a major off of such a whirlwind, uh, having spent time with her family. Uh, but, you know, that kind of a streak, you know, certainly takes it out of you. But I want to I want to add one little little caveat. When I was looking back in 2008, which was the last time we saw a player win four consecutive weeks in a row, which was Lorena Ochoa, I was reading some of my stories from 2008. And in the middle of that stretch, she, of course, won this championship. And then she but she also won in Morelia. And and I, I noted in the story that she didn't hit balls after any of the rounds because she signed 3,000 autographs every day. That's what her team guesstimated on average that she was signing. And and so Lorena, and, and Lorena won by 11 that week. So so yeah. just to kind of put into context, you know, the, uh, you know, what, what these players who have accomplished these incredible feats, you know, what they've done, you know, outside the ropes too, uh, you know, it, that's that's incredible. 3,000 autographs a day, no practice, wins by 11. Yeah, and that, that's a Mexican star in Mexico. It's hard to even describe, you know, what, what that was like. Nelly, I think to your point, what jumps out at me, she won at 20 under in Phoenix. The weather was bad on the weekend, but it was still 20 under that won. And then one under to get into yes. the top eight <laughs> just to make match play. I mean, um, a game that travels is what every player wants, and she got it. And she was driving, kind of a, a throwback to the founders. You know, she was she drove from from LA to Phoenix, then drove from Phoenix to to Vegas, and thankfully she had a, a PJ to get her back to Florida to rest up uh, and and to get ready for this week. Uh, it, it is it's incredible to think about, uh, you know, a chance to win five in a row. Uh, only Nancy Lopez in 1978, Annika back in 2004 and, and five uh, had won five straight starts. You go back and you think Tiger Woods had a couple of streaks of, of six or seven. Those were 15, 16, 17 years ago. Just doesn't happen very often. It, it, it speaks to how hard it is. We'll ask Judy Rankin later in the show about uh, whether or not she thinks it's harder to win now versus back when Nancy was was winning 17 times in her first two years. Uh, we know it's hard to win, period. Uh, but as we look to this week, B.A., and the the, the Chevron, I mean, the, the tournament doesn't begin until Thursday, and there's already been huge buzz. Nelly was on ESPN Sports Center, uh, which puts her in front of eyeballs that maybe aren't accustomed to, to, to seeing, you know, women's golf. But they have been watching the likes of Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese and others uh, have record – you know, uh, ratings for the NCAA women's basketball tournament. And then we got the news this week that the purse has been increased to $7.9 million. And I think sneaky important contract extension Chevron an extra two years through 2029. So tell me your thoughts about the significance of Nelly's arrival on the property this week. And then the big announcement about the purse and the contract extension. Yes. I was, I was first of all, pleased to see her image on some banners when I was driving in because, <laughs> you know, you know, last year it, it, you know, there, there wasn't as much ground buzz as we had hoped, you know, on, in, in terms of foot traffic and fans, especially early week. So I'm hopeful that that's different this time around as you know this is this is new to the area and and so just getting the word out and hopefully Nelly's incredible streak will will help with that as you say being on ESPN um, you know massive taping that right before she did her, her her press conference with everyone on the ground but you know I think when in terms of the money there there was so much angst about this tournament leaving Mission Hills and for for good reason you know I mean we 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 all we all miss not just the history of, of having the event on the Dinosaur Tournament course and what what Dinosaur and, and Billy Foster, you know, what, what they did for the tour, but also it's just 
beautiful. It's a, it's a wonderful track. It's a gorgeous setting. Everyone loved going to Rancho Mirage, and and that's that's definitely missed. And so I think when you see a significant increase like this in the purse, because let's face it, this this purse was the lowest of the majors of the LPGA's five majors yeah. by a wide margin. And so for them to, to for Chevron to put this, um, you know, it this emphasis on 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 not just the purse, but if you miss the cut now, you'll make ten thousand dollars to help cover your expenses, which is which is massive for these players. You know, all the, all the bells and whistles that they're that they're adding to the event. Uh, you know, if you're a past champion this week, you're you're driving a Bentley. For everyone else, you have a free car from Avis. You know that that's a that's a small thing, but it's an it's an important thing for these players. And and so I think you know all all these things are really helping everyone to to kind of come on board with the fact that that this is this championship's new home, and that even though Chevron moved it here for for their reasons, you know, to, to come to where they have a, a large presence, a large thousands of employees, you know that that they are committed. Well, I think it's important also to note that the club at Carlton Woods hosting it for the second time is in for the next uh, several years. They've, uh, th they have made significant changes to the golf course sp specifically uh, this year for the tournament. Uh, it's a Jack Nicklaus design. You had a great finish last year with Lily Avu bookending the season with major championship victories. Uh, beating Angel Yen in a playoff. It was a phenomenal finish. Nelly finished third, by the way. Uh, you had young players, you had stars all up there, and, and Lilia got it done. If Nelly were to win this week, I, I think it would go a long way toward stamping the club at Carlton Woods and the Woodlands outside Houston there as the new home because it's where Nelly extended the streak. Um, and, and and that doesn't that's not the only way that the week can be successful by any means, but, but I I agree that there were there was a lot of concern by a lot of LPGA players, especially those who you know had come before, you know we're leaving Mission Hills we don't have a lot of places like that where we go every single year it was our Masters they used to say, and are we just going to bounce around we're going to go to Houston for a few years and then we'll get another sponsor in a couple of years no. It, it's significant and yes it was the it was the lowest purse of the majors but it had already gone up from 3.1 to 5 million when chevron took over and the fact that they keep adding to the purse tells me it's not just good for now it, it's it's an indication that they're going to keep adding to the purse there are other players in the field apparently i've, I've scoured the the field list and and it's more than just nelly um uh and so uh, let's talk about a couple of those. Um, there are a couple who are going to be grinding and trying to win, but who are on the, the 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 tail end of their careers. One of them is my dear friend and colleague, Angela Stanford, who works for us uh, often on Golf Channel, playing in her 98th consecutive major. And then another is another dear friend, as classy a human being as you'll ever meet, Soyan Yu, who announced that this would be uh, as as a past champion, this would be her swan song. So as you look at the field, Jin Young Ko is coming back, Ataya Titikun, both of those two players coming back from injury. Uh, how do you how do you size up the field and especially those those two great players who are uh, not saying good well in one case saying goodbye and in another case you know still out there representing and trying to play great. Yeah, I think I think you know outside of Nelly, you know a lot of the focus obviously on on Lydia Ko trying to get into the to the LPGA Hall of Fame only has has one point left to to get, and you win a major, you get two. So, so she, yeah, she'd uh, be be in there in, in dramatic fashion because we haven't seen Lydia do much in the majors in a long time. Obviously, a two time major winner, but but it's it's been a long time. So I think when you look at um, you know the contenders. Lilia Vu almost seems like she's uh, being overshadowed a little bit this week, uh, and, and she likes it that way. You know, she mm -hmm. that that's good for her. Uh, and it was interesting listening to her talk about you know while she was waiting to see you know what was going to happen after she signed her scorecard before she went into the playoff that she was she was thinking about her back and how her, her back you know was going to potentially you know tighten up as, as the weather uh, got 
cooler and that her trainer physio actually turned around and drove back to the golf course to help get her ready. And so, you know, of course that's really interesting. We we know what a role her back has played this year. She's had to withdraw to, into tournaments uh, during the Asian swing because of her back and, and really, you know, it's, it's taken a toll on her um, mentally as well. So, uh, she's feeling good though. She says she's about 95% there. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm really interested to see how she does because, you know, her, her grit, her tenacity, she's, she's a gamer, but you can only do so much when you are experiencing physical pain, which takes us a nice transition into Angela Stanford, who has had this remarkably long LPGA career, almost without any injury. She did have, have one, you know, late in her career that she dealt with that took her out for a little bit, but by and large has been extremely healthy and how, how rare that is as she looks to, she's, she looks to get to 100 consecutive majors. Jack Nicholas is the only player who's ever done that in the history of the game. And Angela, of course, is making her 98th consecutive start playing this week on a sponsor exemption. And she's had the same uh, trainer since 2004, gives him a lot of credit for, for keeping her going but you know i just i just think judy the great judy rankin who we'll hear from later you know often says that the women's game doesn't do enough to celebrate itself <laughs> you know yeah. and 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 that's so true you know a lot of times you know the women make it harder than it is and i and i think this is a great time to celebrate what angela stanford has accomplished and what she's doing and you know she's she's put in for a special exemption for the U.S. Women's Open. She's going. She's also signed up for a 36-hole qualifier next week. But I would see this this streak continue because I think we all agree that it's unlikely that anyone will will ever get to even 98, let alone 100, you know, ever again. I agree, uh, and I I hope the USGA, regardless of what Angela does, well, of course, they won't even need to if she qualifies, and I would not put it past her at all. Uh, she's still very competitive, trust me. Um, and um, if she doesn't get in, I hope the USGA will, will give her that exemption because um, there, there just aren't very many people well you said it only jack nicholas has ever done it um but there just aren't enough moments like this in women's golf i think the opportunity to to bring jack in whether it's some type of video greeting or have him on site at lancaster country club uh in pennsylvania in late may early june i, th I think those opportunities are there angela has been a an incredible ambassador for the game, doing a ton for junior golf. She's played a million USGA events through the years. Uh, some would say, well, it's the U.S. Women's Open. It shouldn't be ceremonial. And I would just say they gave an exemption to Annika last year, uh, a great champion who's, who'd won multiple U.S. Women's Open titles. But they didn't give an exemption to Annika because they thought she might win. They, they did it to honor her, to recognize her contributions to the game. It was Pebble Beach. They, they wanted a great icon to play at an iconic course. But I think the same, some of the same things are there with Angela. So, uh, but I'm biased. Just because I'm biased doesn't mean I'm wrong. So I'll say that. Um, <laughs> oh, amen. Yeah. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, looking at, at, at this week and, and the field, uh, again, we've got some wild cards here. You've got, you got Jin Young Ko, who hasn't played much a new injury for her, shoulder injury that's kept her out since the Asian swing. A Ty Titicun hasn't played at all. I did note that that Nelly, um, according to the KPMG Insights, it has a 10% chance of winning, and that's twice as high as anyone else. Titicun is second, which I found fascinating because she hasn't played. We just don't know how she's going to respond. Um, and she was in contention last year until she hit her third shot into the water, the 18th hole, the par five, uh, and made double. Uh, but it, but it, it's been an incredible year already, B.A., with, when you look not just at what Nelly's done, Lydia got that season opening victory. We have Patty Tavitanigat, a winner of this event over at Mission Hill. She has a victory. Hannah Green has a win. And then Bailey Tardy for the party has her Bailey first Tardy. LPGA title. Uh, it, it's been a great start <laughs> to the year. 
Uh, absolutely. And, you know, I think Stacey Lewis thought that that Solheim Cup team, you know, Allison Lee might be the only newcomer on it. But with Bailey Tardy's fine play in China and, and Sarah Schmelzel playing playing terrifically in several events, uh, you know, that, that it, it might be a little bit more wide open than we thought. Uh, it, we'll have to see how that shakes out. But but absolutely, you know, I think, you know, Allison Lee, the hottest player to end the season last year, you know, look look prime to to come out this year with a bang, and then and then this freak accident where she gets bit by her boyfriend's dog of all things and ends up in the hospital, and just this big ordeal that really that really set her back quite a bit at the start of the year. But she's coming into form, you know. It it, it would it would be fun to see her, you know, close the deal and finally get in the winner's circle at, at a major because I I really think she's the type of player. That could be a needle mover out here. She's a package uh, in terms of having all the quality you need for that. So um, I'm, I'm hopeful that that a player like Allison ha- has a good week. We've seen a lot of players break through at the majors uh, for for their first titles over the years. So I wouldn't put it faster. Including my colleague Morgan Pressel, uh, who uh, was the youngest ever winner back. When she got it done in 2007, Morgan will be on the call with Terry Gannon and Tom Abbott and Paige McKenzie, Karen Stubbles, Amy Rogers, and the entire Golf Channel NBC team. Network coverage on the weekend and uh, a ton of coverage on ESPN+. Plus. Will Haskett, uh, Jermaine Pillar, uh, Hope Barnett, and some others are involved in that coverage. So we're going wall to wall starting early on Thursday morning. Uh, and speaking of calling golf, who better for us to bring on for our very first guest on our very first episode then the great judy rank what a joy it is to welcome in a woman who needs no introduction but is going to get one anyway a hall of fame player an award-winning golf broadcaster who just last week was honored with the pga of america's lifetime achievement award in journalism the first woman to receive that honor and perhaps most impressively, a woman who survived the last decade traveling around the world with me as her chauffeur. It's Judy Rankin. Hi, Judy. I almost didn't survive that, but hi, Grant. I'm glad to see you. <laughs> oh, we're so glad you're with us, Judy. <laughs> uh, that, that, that could be an, an entire episode, just uh, the yeah, times absolutely. that you claim I tried to kill you. Maybe yeah. we can get to that later. I'm tougher um, than I knew. Yeah, you are. Uh, but Judy, why don't we just start with what's most current, and that is this incredible run by Nelly Corda. It is introducing a lot of golf fans to some names that maybe some of them, uh, maybe even some of the players today don't know. Players like Joanne Carner, which seems ludicrous to all of us, but uh, I've noticed people are getting younger these days. Uh, and, and so here's Nelly having won four straight tournaments uh, she, she's trying this week to do something that has only been done twice before, and that is when five straight starts. And by the way, a fourth straight event on the LPGA calendar has only been done a couple of times as well. As you think back to the others who've done it, Nancy Lopez, you were winning still back when Nancy was, was in her run. And you were calling a lot of Annika's wins when she was winning a lot in a row. In what ways is Nelly's run similar, do you think? And in what ways uh, were those others different? Wow. Um, well, if you go way back to Nancy Lopez, I think that Nancy was, uh, she had she had almost immediately become the golf world darling. Um, and she was she was on a great high. Um, is she, in my opinion, and I mean this most respectfully to Nancy, she became a much finer player later on uh, than she was at the time when she did that. What she could do when she did that was she could get the ball in the hole and she could score. And uh, and she was loving doing it. And, and it was great for the LPGA Tour, and it was certainly great for her. I really believe, um, and as I say, I say this respectfully, later in her life, in her golf life, she became a much finer player. Um, but I think hers was as much of a um, personal high 
and a media high um, as anything else. I really do. And it's just like she just she just could not um, get in her own way. Everything went beautifully. So uh, you know, I think I think we might have called her Superwoman um, periodically. Yeah. So uh, and then Annika comes along, and it's very different because Annika is very serious. Annika is very driven. Annika is um, of one mind. I think she's she's one of we we always say you know women Beth Ann you'll know this but women tend to be um, have 19 things going on and probably can accomplish 15 of them um, but may, I didn't think that Annika was like that I thought she was she had a single mind and a single purpose and that's how she played and um, you saw it in how she played uh, because there was a uh, there was a magnificent ability to repeat. Now we get to what I see as Nellie Corda. And I see Nellie Corda uh, not the same, but a little bit. I see Mickey Wright in her. And I think I, I thought about this question. And I think because I, I saw Mickey play a lot, I played with Mickey at Paramount. And, um, I was a kid, but I was enthralled as every author was with Mickey Wright and her abilities. But what I see similar in the two of them is I think they're both a bit perfectionist. And when I when I think we see Nellie as looking like it's not important and she doesn't care, uh, that's Nellie saying that I am really aggravated with myself. You know, I'm. I can do better than this, mm. and, um, and and so I think she gets. I think she gets a little up to here with herself when she's not performing at the level she believes she should, mm. um, and it comes off as disinterested. But that's not what she is at all. Right. And uh, they are similar in the fact that they both had. Nellie has um, technically beautiful ball swings. Judy, what do you think it is? You know, we've we've kind of watched Nellie grow up on the LPGA. What do you, what do you think it is that she's found recently that has enabled her to go on this kind of a run? Well, I don't I don't really know. You know, I'm not there every day like I was for so long. I've become a viewer, which is good. I mean, I love it. But um, I, I think she I think she's found that way of getting out of her own way. Uh, I think she's, and maybe she's, maybe she's a little more, um, a little more concentrated on scoring, and a little less concentrated on perfection. And I think you have to do that when you're playing golf, you know, five and six days a week competitively. Because uh, in the end, it doesn't matter how beautiful your golf swing was. We've all known some beautiful golf swings that didn't make it. Um, in the end, it's uh, what the score is what counts. And I think maybe maybe maturity has made her a tiny little bit easier on herself. I think her caddy works well with her to keep her from getting too aggravated with herself. And I think she's blessed with um, what the competitive gene from her parents and the siblings and all of them have that competitive gene. Well, can you take us back to Nancy really quick in that rookie season and? <laughs> and how she was embraced by the sports world in general outside of, of, of the small golf world? Well, she had, she had and she has a winning smile. And uh, she was smiling her way around the golf course, which I don't know that many of us did. I, I felt like, you know, I was out there probably grim-faced and working. Um, and I didn't, I didn't quite know how to handle crowds like Nancy did. Nancy was so good, um, you know, at a, a little distance with the people. Uh, she really was. And she was, you know, um, my time had been a couple of years before. And uh, I think I, I was probably heralded for um, playing really well and having a family. Uh, having a, you know our little boy along a lot of the time, but 
she was just, she was a, a new face, a smiling face. Um, she was Mexican American, which added to um, the bubbly charm, I believe. And um, and she she was getting the ball in the hole. I remember I remember a particular shot when she won at Kings Island, um, which at the time I don't know it might have been the LPJ Championship on yep. in Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I remember on a hole, it's some hole on the back nine maybe 15, 16, somewhere in there. And she hit this awful second shot. I mean, really awful and screamed it over the green and it's back in some kind of junk, you know? And anyway, from there she holds it. So there was a, that's, kind, that's kind of the way it was going. And, uh, and I think she, I really think she thought uh, she could always recover and she was recovering. And I, I learned years later that the way her dad taught her was he would say, hit the ball, which she would do. He'd say, go find it and hit it again and get it in the hole. And, you know, it's not, not the worst golf lesson I ever heard. And I, I kind of admire his uh, tactic. Judy, that's that's who she was though right that was her personality on and off the course she was that kind you hear about arnold palmer he he didn't just enjoy the people he needed that that personal interaction to almost fuel him and so i'm thinking about annika who as you noted very introverted um had to step out of her comfort zone in a lot of ways to carry the banner for the lpga tour I think Nellie is closer to Annika than she is Nancy in that way. Uh, and it, and it's, it is intrusive. You know that you were on the cover of Sports Illustrated as a teenager. Uh, it, it is intrusive. I'm just wondering, let's say Nellie were to win this week. Uh, in, in what should be a reasonable expectation of Nellie as a human being, but also a great player who's doing things that really haven't been done either in a long time or ever. And then, and how can the LPGA capitalize on this run? Hmm. Big question. Well, that's uh, why we have you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the LPGA works day and night trying to figure out how to capitalize on these um, pretty extraordinary things. Uh, that happened on the LPGA Tour and the pretty extraordinary challenge out there. Um, you know, <laughs> Nellie has, I, for, it's still the case, you know, the, the most of the fans, if you ever go to a tournament, we've all been to them many times, <clears throat> it's still the case where most of the fans are men quite a few women now, and a number of kids. But you need that male audience to say, wow. And we've started to see that, I think, with PGA Tour players, who have played with Nelly, who have played with so many of these girls, Leona McGuire, for instance, um, some of these girls that are just so darn good, like Lydia. You know, Jason Day says he needs web lessons from Lydia. Yeah. So when those people who people consider, and we all consider, the very best players in the game, uh, they have a strength advantage, but, and so that makes them the very best players in the game. But the very best women in the game um, need to be recognized by those people. And when every time that they are really recognized by those people, uh, all the sports world takes notice. There's just no doubt about it. And... Um, So it's not it's not it's not the male golfer's responsibility to do that, um, but it is the right thing to do because she she and these players are the best, the very best in the world that our gender has put forward, and it needs to be recognized how really good they are, and they are really good. So how do you capitalize if Nelly keeps going? You know, part of that Nelly. Nellie has to put herself out there. And Nellie has to um, show people 
Um, Nellie has to show people her look when she's not playing golf. Because Nellie is a beautiful young woman. And there's nothing that says you have to be that to be a talented golfer. But if you are that, along with being a talented golfer, good heavens, take advantage. You know, you don't think um, Jordan Spieth took advantage of being a nice looking guy? You don't think that makes a difference? It does. It's not, it's not just in the female world. It's in the world in general. Um, people like and people are attracted to nice looking people. I'm not saying it's the right thing, but I'm saying it's the way of the world. Very true. <laughs> what Judy, when we when we when we look back on on your your playing career, Grant has a favorite stat. <laughs> that, oh boy, that here we I, go with the stats. Of, of, of yours um and i you know he's king of minutia but this is such a good one so i want him to to first tell us this the, his favorite judy rankin stat and then i'll ask you the question well right. yeah um i'm anxious to hear it oh yeah you've heard it before uh i should preface this by saying it was not uncommon uh for all the years that judy and i worked together uh that i would say something like you know judy i was just noticing this that or the other long before we had the KPMG insights, uh, I would cook up some harebrained statistic and I'd say, Judy, what do you think about that? And she literally on the air in Arkansas one day said, what do I think? I think you need to get a life. Um, <laughs> and, so good. and I said, well, I have one. It's just not very interesting. Um, but, <laughs> but Judy is the all time, from best I can tell, the all time leader in postpartum LPGA victories. Your first win, in fact, was the year you had Tui. Yes. And of that all baby, things. I want people to know that that baby uh, is a grandfather. Oh my gosh, he's 56 years old. Doesn't look it. He gets your genes. Uh, oh, so good. Uh, well, so good. So, you know, so Judy, just, we've seen a number of moms come back. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, I think when you have um, a child or children on the LPGA tour, and it's a considerably, it's not easy, never be easy, but it's easier today because there's a lot of help around. Um, but I do think uh, you use your time really well. And uh, you can't quite be so self-focused. Well, yeah. You know, we've seen a number of moms come back recently uh, and Sophia Popov, Caroline Masson, uh, Lindsay Weaver, uh, you know, how, how difficult is it to win in the modern game as a mom? Cause Stacey Lewis did it in 2020, but you almost have to go, you know, back a decade before you find the mom, you know, before her, it's, it's so rare these days. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not exactly sure why, because, you know, you don't lose any of your ability. Nancy Lopez won um, any number of times after she had, I don't know, all three of her girls, but certainly one or two of them. And um, uh, we go back to the um, great player who's hosting me this week in her home, Julie Inkster. <laughs> Um, she did pretty well. She's second uh, in postpartum victories to you. With kids in tow. Uh, so, you know, I'm not sure why that is. Um, I do think, I do think your life is, you know, so busy. Uh, and, um, there, are, you know, there, there's just a lot of complications. Uh, but maybe you don't work as hard. Maybe you do work as hard and it, it just doesn't come together. That's, that's hard to say. Um, but um, becoming a parent on the LPGA Tour is quite different than becoming a parent on the PGA Tour. Yeah, that's a great point. We talk yeah. about, oh boy, he, you know, he, he had to leave this tournament. It was Scotty Scheffler, uh, you know, was yeah. talking about leaving. But uh, then you have Katrina Matthew, who wins a major nine weeks after having a baby. That's a little more impressive in my book. I, I, I was just thinking of that. I know. It, it, it's one of the most underrated accomplishments, I think, in golf history. But I wonder, Judy, would you share a story or two just about um, those days of dropping Tui off and 
uh, this was long before the days of the, the Smuckers uh, daycare where, where everything was taken care of for a player. Not that it isn't still difficult, but you, you've shared some, and tui has been through therapy. He's well adjusted. He's done great. <laughs> But, but there were some wild stories. There were. Um, at, at one point, a little later on, my, my stepsister um, came out. She was a student at UCLA, and she would travel with us, and it was the four of us. You know, in the car with all the stuff, there was a pink motorcycle between Tui and Lizzie in the back seat of the car. And, I mean, we were up to here. We looked like the Beverly Hillbillies, um, but, but we made it. But Lizzie would take care of most of the kids that were out there, and there was about six. One of them was, um, one of the interesting times was at a motel called Scott's Inn in Columbus, Ohio. And I think my son, Tui, was about four, maybe five, maybe six, right in that age. And um, he got to messing with the fire and she's got all these sick kids in tow, you know. And she was telling him, do not touch that. And he's a pretty good kid most of the time. But he pulled the deal. And the <laughs> fire department came. <laughs> and um, he was nowhere to be found. He was under the bed in our room, scared to death. Anyway, he kind of, we learned right then that when somebody said something was serious, it was serious. The fire department had a talk with him. <laughs> So that was one. Another one, I was one of the very first times I was by myself with him. Um, Yippee, my, my husband, his dad was coming, but I was alone and it was going to be Pro Am Day. And in those days, you had to play in the Pro Am to play in the tournament. And some people from the club had helped me to find a babysitter in an apartment complex. And so I had her phone number and her address, and I'm driving there. And I think I played kind of early in the morning. I'm not positive about that but uh i took him up the steps and we enter and you know seemingly nice gal and i turn the corner in her apartment and the first thing i see is the largest aquarium i've ever seen in my life with a python in it and i said you know i lost the phone number and i just stopped to tell you that i wasn't going to need you today <laughs> and <laughs> perfect <laughs> And, and I got to the course, and of course, if I don't play, and I'm not sure what I'm going to do. And one wonderful, magnificent volunteer lady said, I'll take him to my house, you play, and I'll bring him back here when you're finished. And, wow. you know, thank, thank, the, thank heaven for all the volunteers over the years. And it's not the first time a volunteer took care of him when, um, when I was, um, you know, in a pickle. But, uh, you know, Lord bless Smuckers. <laughs> yeah. Well, good good branding for our show. This is the yes. big pickle, so that's perfect. Uh, and, and, uh, is this Judy, a sour? Is this a sour note or a sweet? No, note? no, no. This is all, this is all sweet. This is all this this is the sweet pickle. Um, Judy, you've already had a you've already had a big week. I know the champions' dinner was was Monday night. Uh, I wonder if you could just share what that experience was like and maybe your thoughts as someone who won at Mission Hills, who broadcast all those years at Mission Hills, who loved Mission Hills, uh, your thoughts now on year two in the Woodlands uh, and this new identity that the Chevron Championship is trying to create. Well, we will always miss Mission Hills, but I can't not applaud Chevron enough and what they've done and what they're doing and how unbelievably first class everything they do is and how they are um, really recognizing uh, player uh, both today and in the past. So uh, we past champions had a lovely couple, three days. And uh, I don't know that another tournament does that for us in, in such a wonderful way. Anyway, so I think I think Chevron's commitment is um, is big time and for real, and I embrace every single thing they're doing, and I really hope and pray that half of Houston comes out and watches those women play. Hang on one second. Um, excuse me. We are live. The Big Pickle first episode. <laughs> 
And when Looking Judy Rankin says, hang on, you hang on. Looking oh, look. look who it is. Oh, yes. <laughs> so perfect. That's the grocery shopper. You can't make it up. Yes. That would make you happy. You can't. She the best is hosting events tomorrow at her club here in La Quinta, tradition. And it is called the Inkster Cup. And I am being Pat Hurst because she is the team captain for the blue team. And Pat could not make it. Okay. So I'm Pat Hurst tomorrow. And Julie Inkster is actually Julie Inkster. And 76 <laughs> club members, women, are playing in the Inkster Cup. Love that's it. Pat! That's Pat! Oh, that's fan. <laughs> Growing the game. If we could just, <laughs> if, if we it. could, if we could just get Julie to kind of come out of that shell she's in, maybe, maybe one day she could make it. <laughs> I want to tell you, we have been on the road. We have been traveling. Maybe I've been on the road a little longer than she has, but she was up in Adam this morning, and she's already been to the workout, and she's already been to the grocery store. So um, nothing stops her, and I'm not sure. If she really set her mind to it, she couldn't play competitively again on the LPJ tour. I wouldn't bet against him. She says no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I hope that I hope that little oh, we, pass through was good. That was perfect. That was perfect. Oh, that was fantastic. Which before we go to our next topic, Judy, can are, are you still working on your golf game in the desert there? How is your game? Starting again today. You know, in January I started playing golf again because Ms. Inkster is after me to stay active and keep doing. Uh -oh. We're going to go hit balls today. <laughs> I love out. it. <laughs> this is already, this is by far the best podcast we've ever done. It's the best. We, it, it, it's easily our best show ever. We have become sort of mutton uh, Jeff. Without Don't question. <laughs> Oh my goodness. I love it. I love it. <laughs> BA, why don't you take the next one? I love one? you too. And I, I really hope you are very successful with this. And I'll get back to serious. So what are we going, where are we no, going don't, now? Don't, don't ever get back to serious. <laughs> well, Judy, we, we had a, a fun conversation earlier in the year about your broadcasting career. And you were telling me the little known fact that you actually considered going to Missouri to study journalism and, was, and maybe play some collegiate golf. <laughs> well, it's kind of, it, I, I, in my fourth grade teacher told my father I'd be a writer. Um, didn't quite happen. Uh, and I, I, now I tend to write the way I talk. So some people say I don't make always the complete sentence, but when I read it, it sounds like me. So, um, but, uh, <laughs> Yeah, as a 16-year-old and all, I thought, you know, they, they were just, just starting women's golf college programs. Joanne Carner, I think, had been the first to get a scholarship at um, Arizona State. And uh, that, you know, seemed to be a real outside possibility. But, in fact, there was no women's golf team at that time. And that didn't happen. I think it worked out okay well, I, for you. I I. I, I think it did too. And I, I remember you saying one time in a, in a speech, something along the lines of, you know, you don't know that you're a pioneer when you're, when you're doing it, you're just kind of doing, and I, I'm sure you said it a lot better than that, but that was kind of the gist. <laughs> so, so I, I was hoping you could just kind of take us back to the early days of, of pioneering <laughs> in, in the broadcast career. And, and maybe what was the most difficult part about that transition? Well, Grant and I have some friends who have asked if I traveled by covered wagon, and I did not. Um, so it was, uh, you know, I, I came out when I was 17. It was the early 60s, 62. And I only played nine tournaments that year. But, you know, players didn't have a team like they have now. You were kind of on your own. And I was uh, riding with another player. And uh, you would share a room. I, I love to say this. You would share a room. And your share would be eight dollars. You know that that kind of gives you a timeline, uh, what that was like. But um, uh, I think at, at every turn in in my life and my golf life and um, whatever has happened along the way, and then the television life, you're doing what everybody's doing every day. 
they're doing what they're supposed to do. They're putting one foot in front of the other and doing it the best they can. And uh, uh, there are days when you know, you're dragging that one foot in front of the other, and there are days when you're skipping. But um, I don't think that's true with just golfers or um, I, I shudder to call myself an athlete, but professional athletes. But I think that's true with people everywhere, whatever their job is and what they're doing. And then if you happen to make some kind of mark, um, they say that. They say that you're a pioneer, that you, you, you know, broke a glass ceiling, you whatever. But um, uh, the truth is, I guess I did. I didn't exactly know it at the time. Um, I was trying to do the job the best I could and in television, keep the job, you know. Um, I played really poorly at the end of my career. I, I, I like to say, and I believe it's factual, that I had a minor nervous breakdown. And um, uh, television came along and opened a whole new wor world for me. So, I, and I, I continually thank all the men I worked with. Because at that point in my life, I can't say this would be the case now, but at that point in my life, had it been confrontational, I would not have laughed. Um, and it was not confrontational. It was encouragement. It was allowing me to find my way a little bit and so on. And uh, I am so lucky uh, for the group of people that it was at ABC Sports. And um, it's continued on with these great friendships, like why in the world would I do this for Grant Boone? <laughs> well, anyway. I, I ask myself that all the time. Yeah, so great, great friendships and um, I, I the, the fact that a few things have happened in my life where I was the first woman or for a long time the only woman, um, that's kind of gratifying to me. And I tell you, I, take, I do take great pleasure in watching some of, the, some of the gals who are doing really well today. I do. It's, that makes me feel good. And um, uh, so the door that was open wasn't, um, it wasn't just to get a woman on a broadcast, but it it all it was it was meaningful in that a woman on the broadcast could be significant and could um, make fair calls and all of those things so i think when i think when that was recognized other people started getting a shot well i know that morgan uh, our colleague was the first woman to be in the booth as an analyst at a men's major last year at the men's open dotty <laughs> Uh, one of your players on the Solheim Cup team, first first walker ever at the Masters. You know they'd, mm -hmm. they'd always have tower announcers, but she's out there walking. First woman to be a part of the broadcast, and and they they stand on your shoulders. I've got one more question for you, Judy, before we wrap up, because there are entire episodes, uh, a whole new jar of big pickles to open about your broadcast days. But uh, to, to me, a question that I think you could answer, or at least who. I think your insight is as valuable as anyone's on this question. And, and it's relevant to Nelly trying to, to match Annika and Nancy. Is it harder to win now than it was at, at, in previous eras? Back when you were playing, back when Kathy was in her prime, which is also your prime, later with Nancy, then with Annika. Is it harder now? I think you have. I think the answer to that question has to be yes because of depth. There were always great players. There were always great players who had to work hard to win. Um, I think the really great players, the Mickey Wrights and the Kathy Whitworths, would have been great in any era. Mm. But I do believe the depth in women's golf today makes it harder um, because if Nelly's trying to beat Leona McGuire and Lexi Thompson and whomever, whomever uh, this week. Next week, if they back off, there's five more who are, you know, just as good. So depth makes a big difference, and that makes my answer yes. Good. Judy, uh, there couldn't have been a better first guest, and apparently we're going to get through it without any injury. So Amen. That's good. So far, knock on wood. <laughs> hey, you know, I, th I think when you didn't succeed in killing me the first couple of times, you've given it up. 
It, I'm t- I've, I've, I've gotten, I'm getting a new life and this yes. is part of it. So Judy, we love you and thanks for joining us on The Big Pickle. I love you both and I hope you have enormous success. Thank you, Judy. Oh, and I, and I, wait, I have to oh, say one thing. We miss you. He's a grandfather. I'm a great grandmother and you're a mom. Oh, Woo-hoo. so good for all three of us. Yay. Bye. Well, any time with Judy Rankin is time well spent. Uh, she is a delight and, and a dear friend. Uh, B.A., what do you think about what Judy had to say? Well, I, I loved her comparisons with Nellie Corda and Mickey Wright. You know, there are Same. so few players left that could give us that kind of insight. And, you know, she. I also loved what she had to say about Nellie stepping out uh, out of her shell a little bit going forward uh, beyond uh, what she does inside the ropes. I thought that was really important. Uh, her stories about her son and, and <laughs> where she sometimes would leave him, uh, it, 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 it does speak to an amazing time on the LPGA tour. Uh, and and she handled it all beautifully, as did her son, Tui, and all of those those great players uh, back then who, who were – uh, traveling with their families. Uh, it's also a great time right now. And, and we, you know, we could be on the, on the cusp of where we are. We're on the cusp of, of, of history here, BA, with Nelly. If she gets it done this week and wins for a fifth straight start and a fourth straight event on the LPGA calendar, by the way, she'd be the first since Lydia in 2016 to win a major as the number one ranked player in the world, as Scotty Scheffler was last week at the Masters. What do you think it could mean for the LPGA Tour? And and uh, I'll kind of ask you what I asked Judy, you know, where where do the LPGA and Nelly herself, where do they fit in to that equation? Well, the fact that it will be on NBC is is huge you know uh, exposure is everything you know it's it's not just playing for the money the, the increased purses that that's important people need to see these players and, and nelly needs to become a household name so you know I, I think if nelly gets it done on sunday i'd love to see her on a plane to new york for for an immediate media tour and and you know the likes of which we, we saw when when michelle we won at pinehurst uh, back in 2014, the U.S. Women's Open, I actually was able to, to go along with Michelle on that media tour in New York and, and see firsthand uh, the impact of it. So um, I, I hope I hope that Nellie embraces that. I hope that we start to see her uh, do more things outside of, of you know, the small the small golf golf audience and, and say yes, because, you know, Stacey Lewis said it yesterday in a press conference, what, what does the LPGA need for Melly? At this point in time, the tour needs her to say yes more. Of course, it's a two-way street. The LPGA also needs to pro- help provide some opportunities for, for Nelly uh, to say yes too, and also to, to continue to make the stage uh, as, as grand as they can for her and, and get as many eyeballs as possible on, on the product. Because everyone can agree that in terms of the depth, the quality of the play, it's never been greater. And, and to your point about Judy just a minute ago uh, and, and what she endured with childcare and, and finding volunteers to pick up the slack, what, what these women went through for so many decades to build what these players are enjoying today the responsibility that they have to carry that torch and to keep that going, to leave it better for the next generation cannot be emphasized enough. The responsibility extends far beyond their personal brand. And I think, you know, listening to what Judy did and, and her peers, the sacrifices that they made to make all of this possible for players to have the Smucker's Day care that they do right now, uh, that they enjoy uh, and, and to play for $7.9 million dollars is um it's it's quite remarkable we just did a podcast the first one <laughs> out did. of the jar <laughs> the we just took a lot of our phone conversations and recorded them <laughs> that's all we did the big pickle is underway uh we don't have time to explain the origin of the name maybe next show we can get into that 
Uh, in the meantime, enjoy the Chevron Championship. Thank you for listening to The Big Pickle. If you are so kind and so inclined, we'd love for you to subscribe to the podcast, to share it, to leave a review and a rating. Uh, and we will look forward to seeing you next week. Ethan Nichols, I'm Grant Boone. Thanks for watching and listening to The Big Pickle.